from Cole. Thank you very much. Uh, and welcome everyone uh, uh, tonight uh, for, for another webinar, uh, the US role in Bolivia's coup uh, and what it means uh, for Latin America. Uh, we are we are honored to be uh, to be joined uh, by Mark Weisbrot uh, tonight, and we'll we'll have a lot to discuss. But but first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, all of the organizations that uh, are co-sponsoring uh, this program with us tonight. Uh, a big thank you to uh, Lift the Sanctions Massachusetts, uh, to Maine Peace Action, New Hampshire Peace Action. Uh, Boston CISPIS, the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice, the Western New York Peace Center, and the Internationalism Working Group of Boston uh, DSA. So thank you to everyone for uh, helping us put this on and for uh, putting the word out uh, to your members uh, about this uh, important, important program. Uh, so as all of you know, um, Last November 10th, uh, the Bolivian president, uh, Evo Morales, was removed from office uh, in an apparent coup. Uh, the new government, uh, led by interim president Janine Añez, uh, almost immediately uh, began violently repressing uh, protesters and, and demonstrators, uh, leading to deaths, uh, especially among the indigenous community uh, of Bolivia. Um, given, given the primary role of, of uh, holding new elections, uh, the Añez government then went on to delay uh, repeatedly uh, elections uh, until now, uh, and, and elections have been scheduled for October the 18th, so, so just a little over two weeks uh, uh, from today. Uh, so tonight we're going to be looking at uh, how the OAS, the Organization of American States uh, and the U.S. government, uh, helped the right wing in Bolivia overturn the results of last year's election and install the Añez uh, government. Um, so independent observers from various countries, uh, including outside of the OAS, are going to be doing their best uh, to publicize any voter suppression or illegal actions. Um, many people are worried about uh, the government in power right now attempting uh, to steal the election. Uh, so tonight we're going to be uh, looking at a, a few things that, uh, that you can do uh, to, to help. Um, and, and we have, uh, we have a form uh, that we're gonna be putting up uh, for you to contact your members of, of Congress to, to help them, uh, to help raise awareness uh, and, and give some publicity to what's going on uh, in Bolivia, uh, to shine more of a light on it uh, and hopefully provide some more transparency uh, and some fairness uh, in, in this upcoming uh, election. Uh, there's also a, a GoFundMe uh, page that we have set up uh, that will uh, give you a chance to, to donate uh, to uh, communities in Bolivia uh, that are struggling uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So there's a couple of ways uh, that you can get involved. Uh, but uh, I want to introduce uh, tonight's guest, uh, an economist, and one of the foremost uh, experts on Latin American policy, uh, Mark Weisbrot. Uh, Mark Weisbrot is the co-director for the Center for Economic and Policy Research down in Washington, DC. Uh, he has written numerous research papers on economic policy. Uh, he writes a regular uh, column on economic and policy issues. Uh, and uh, he was also uh, the co-author of the paper, Economic Sanctions as Collective Punishment, the Case of Venezuela, uh, which he wrote with Jeffrey Sachs. And I know that many of you uh, have read that. It has been a great resource uh, for us. So uh, we're very pleased to be joined uh, uh, by Mark Weisbrot. And without further ado, I would like to uh, turn it over to our guest tonight. Take it away, Mark. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Brian, and thanks to you and to Cole for organizing this and for everybody who uh, showed up. And I want to uh, just, oh, if you want more information or any of our information, you can find it at uh, CEPR, uh, Center for Economic and Policy Research, and that's just CEPR.net. Uh, and uh, so we've been uh, doing a lot on Bolivia since the coup. In fact, we've probably put more hours in on this than the Organization of American States did uh, overall, hundreds of hours uh, doing papers, uh, statistical analyses. And, you know, it's not actually anywhere near as complicated as uh, people think it is. In other words, the statistical analyses that we did, most of them were just to uh, debunk the statistical analyses that were put forth after the original story of the Organization of American States fell apart. In other words, they resorted to uh, various uh, statistical uh, manipulation, and not just statistical, by the way, also uh, they put out a final uh, audit report where they tried to focus on irregularities. And that was actually their position after their original story of fraud was uh, discredited. And it was even uh, in the New York Times on June 7th uh, when they showed that the, uh, they used one of the statistical uh, studies uh, that was out there to show that the OAS story of fraud was, was false. And so the OAS, um, the person in charge of elections there, uh, said to the Times, well, yeah, we don't care anymore about the statistical analysis that we did or the original story that we had. Now we're looking at all the irregularities. And of course, all elections have irregularities. And it turned out that the things they were trying to point out after their story uh, fell apart didn't amount to much. One of my, uh, two of my colleagues did a, uh, a long uh, paper looking at the audit report, and you can find that as well. But I want to go through it just uh, since we have a little bit of time to just show how the OAS really lied. And I, I don't use that word uh, casually. I'm talking about their actual intent. In other words, they didn't just make a mistake when they issued that first uh, press statement on uh, October uh, 21st, the day after the election, which uh, said basically that uh, the election was stolen or implied it very strongly. I'll give you the exact words in a minute. But just to note that the Times, uh, New York Times in their June 7th article said that it was their uh, analysis that day after the election, which they continued repeating for months, uh, that, uh, quote, fooled, uh, fueled a chain of events that changed the South American nation's history. In other words, this was the political foundation of the coup d'etat on uh, November 10th, was this story that they stole the election. And this is the one that was promoted and still many people believe all over the place, even though the OAS itself has practically given up on it. And I say practically because the head of the OAS, Luis Almagro, will still uh, say things like, uh, you know, that uh, support it, but uh, it's, it's really the foundation of a coup. So this is, why is this so important? I, I, mean, I just want to say, uh, you know, this is a, a very blatant and overt case of a government being overthrown, uh, a democratically elected government, I should say, and no one disputes that this was a democratically elected government when it was overthrown. In other words, even the people alleging fraud in this election have conceded that Evo Morales was democratically elected in 2014, and his uh, term was not over when the military forced him to step down. And of course, you know, you can still read the New York Times today and the media, and they'll say things like when they report the, the coup, they won't use the word coup very often, and, and they'll say instead that uh, a power vacuum was created and he left the country, but the military told him uh, to leave. 
to step down. And uh, so it was a military coup, just as much as any military coup that is, you know, has happened in Latin America. Uh, it just they didn't actually uh, point the gun at his uh, forehead, but they told him he had to leave. And it's also a a very uh, brutal uh, government that replaced. Uh, Evo Morales, you had a report recently, which didn't get a lot of media, but it was reported. It was from the Harvard uh, Law School International Human Rights Clinic, Clinic and the uh, University Network for Human Rights. And they found that the month uh, of the coup was the second deadliest month in terms of civilian deaths committed uh, by state forces. Uh, since Bolivia became a democracy nearly 40 years ago. And they describe the two, especially the two massacres that were committed by uh, state forces. And, uh, and they also describe the racism of it in, in quite uh, a lot of detail. First, that all the uh, people killed in these two massacres were indigenous. And uh, secondly, just the kind of racist, uh, epithets that the troops used when they attacked uh, protesters and they shot at them and, and so on. And so this was, you know, and, and th that's a big part of the story as well, of course, because Bolivia is, uh, has the highest percentage of indigenous uh, population in the hemisphere. And, you know, it's somewhere between 40 and 50%. And uh, the, uh, the this was a big part of what happened when Abel Morales became the first indigenous president. Uh, the situation of indigenous people uh, improved, uh, you know, enormously, uh, and uh, this and they had a voice that they hadn't had before, and that uh, and and this coup was very much a return of uh, the white and mestizo. Uh, elite that uh, had run the country uh, prior to 2006. And so that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's part of the story uh, and a very big part of the story. But let's look for a moment at the election itself and what happened so that we can just get a really short but clear uh, picture of this false uh, story that the OAS told. So you had, uh, a count uh, called, well, the initials in Spanish were the TREP count, but it was a preliminary count of the vote that was carried out by private contractors. It's not an official count, but it's a count that is done and reported so that people get some information about the election while they're waiting for the official count to be tallied, which takes longer uh, because it's done more thoroughly and carefully. But this count was actually turned out to be okay. Uh, it just, it, it doesn't really, it's important to understand that this count doesn't even uh, really determine anything, but it was there. And after 84% uh, of this count was reported, uh, the um, Evo Morales was ahead with 45.7% uh, of the vote. And he was ahead by 7.9 percentage points uh, next uh, ahead of his the second place uh, finisher. And then it was the count was interrupted. And then when it resumed 23 hours later, uh, Evo was ahead by 10.2 uh, percentage points. So this gave him uh, more than 40% of the vote and a 10 point lead. And that's the requirement to avoid a second round. In other words, he was going to win in the second round. And when the final count came in, the official count, it was 10.5. So uh, the uh, opposition, which had leaders had already stated they weren't going to accept the result anyway if they didn't win, um, you know, they took to the streets and there was violence. And then the OAS comes out with a press statement the next day. And it says, uh, and before the official count was even completed, and they expressed 
quote, a deep concern and surprise at the drastic and hard to explain change in the trend of the pre preliminary results after the closing of the polls. And of course, they presented no evidence for that claim. And of course, it turned out they didn't have any. And so here, um, if uh, I can show uh, the basic arithmetic of this, um, let me see, do you have the slide? I sent one slide. Okay, um, I'll put it up. Let's see. Put that there up. Go. The only one. And I think it's good for people to see it. What's that? There, that's it. great. Okay, so what this is, is this shows you take the uh, margin that AVO had for the first 84% of the vote that was reported in the, uh, in the preliminary unofficial count, okay? And there, as I said, he was ahead by 7.9 percentage points. And then you say, okay, let's look at all the locations, the, the areas that those uh, votes uh, were in, because there were a lot of votes from the same areas that were reported in the second uh, part of the count, which was the one that the OES was alleging uh, was uh, to explain and basically stolen. And actually, you know, Almagro, Luis Almagro, the Secretary General, did actually use the word stolen uh, a couple of weeks later. So they weren't, you know, he was more hardline than the people who were on his staff, but they were all saying the same thing. So, okay, so let's take a look at the, um, these areas. So you look at these areas that uh, weren't reported in the first, uh, the first tranche, the first 84%, but you look at the locations that contain these 16% uh, that were reported, you know, second, okay, after the interruption. And it turns out, just by looking at that, you can see that his margin in those areas was 22%. So it's exactly what you would expect to happen. I'll do the arithmetic in a minute, but you can see what happened here. It happens in a lot of elections. And uh, what happens is that votes that come in later are not all, uh, the areas can be geographically uh, different than, and demographically uh, different. Sorry, they're geographically different. They're demographically different and they're politically different than the ones that come in first. And this can happen a lot of places. It happens because they're rural, it happens because they're poor, whatever it is. And it turned out that Abel's margin in these areas containing the later reported uh, precincts was 22%. So what happened? What happened is that the more uh, pro Moss, his party, areas reported later. That's all that happened. That's, and that data was right on the web. And that's why we put out a press release the, you know, the, the day after the OAS press release and just showed them. And so they knew uh, right away that this allegation they were making was false. And they never had an explanation. And, uh, you know, like a response, for example, to the arithmetic. And here I'm going to give you the actual arithmetic for those who just want, and this is the only arithmetic I'll put in here, but this shows you how simple it is. You didn't need the <coughs> analyses. So here you can see in the, uh, the little equation below the graph, if you take uh, the 84%, 0.84, and multiply it by Evo's margin there, and then you take the 16%, the later 16%, and you multiply it by the margin that should be point, uh, that should be, yeah, that's 22, sorry, that's right. You multiply that by 22, which is the margin of the areas that contained these later reported precincts. And what do you get? You add that, you get 10.2, okay? So you would expect them to get around 10% uh, just on the basis other votes that were reported in the first 84% of 
the vote count, which nobody is alleging was uh, fraudulent. They're just saying they cheated in the interregnum. That's how the vote was supposedly stolen. So anybody could see this. And I emphasize this because we're talking about people, the electoral observation mission and the head of elections for the OAS. These are people who, they specialize in this, okay? So here's what you would have to believe if you believe that they just made a mistake and they weren't lying. You'd have to believe that they're basically the stupidest people on earth because they oversee these elections all the time. And in their subsequent reports, they did not even consider, and in their press release too, they never considered the possibility uh, that these areas that came later were somehow politically or demographically different than the ones that reported earlier. Now that is just not a believable story. In other words, I would, I would argue that this is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the standard in our criminal justice system, that they actually lied, that they didn't just do something really stupid. Because there's no way that it didn't occur to them to look at this possibility. And you can go to the web and look at their next uh, reports and see that they still didn't mention it, even after it was put in their face. And by the way, you know, they were asked by reporters about this and they didn't answer for months. They didn't, they wouldn't take, they put out press releases and they don't even answer questions from the media. And then you had uh, four members of Congress led by Jan Schakowsky in November, November 25th, they sent her, they sent the OAS these questions, a question just like this, a couple of questions like, did you consider this possibility? And they still have an answer and it's almost a year later. And so, uh, and here's something that hasn't been in the news uh, because nobody knows about it yet because these were two closed door briefings that were done by the OAS in the last month or so. And uh, these briefings, in these briefings, the top officials of the OAS electoral division were invited to answer uh, questions and they were asked the same questions that Jan Schakowsky and the others asked. And they said, um, you know, and, and they asked them, what did you think? And, and they, they never gave a substantive answer to any of the questions that would have forced them to tell, uh, which would have forced them to tell further lies. And so they just, they didn't really answer. And so that's, uh, that's more uh, proof. And this is where I wanna get to uh, before, at the end of this, uh, what people can do about it, because here's a good place uh, to, to, to mention this, because uh, Jan Schakowsky had an op-ed, which you can find in The Hill, where she said that uh, she threatened uh, that the Congress could have an investigation, and she actually, I think, said that they should have an investigation of the OAS, and, you know, the U.S. Congress supplies 60 percent of their funding. And so that, I think, is something that might very well happen. And of course, not that much happens now because we're headed into a, a pretty important election in the next 30 days. But uh, I think a lot of things will change. We can talk about that too, uh, you know, what, what will change after the election. Uh, but I think that that is something that you can do anybody in this audience who has contact or can make contact with their representative in Congress can ask them to support and support it openly and speak in favor of having an investigation of what the OAS actually did in Bolivia. Because this is how the coup happened. I don't, I don't know if it, I don't think it would have happened without this uh, support from the Organization of American States because it really shaped the media. The media took the OAS as a neutral arbiter, uh, which it hasn't been, by the way, historically, uh, some of the time. Most of the time, I think they are. Uh, but in, in very special situations like this one, where the Trump administration was uh, pushing them to, according to some you know, press reports here, uh, they, they were not neutral and it was much worse than not being neutral. 
they actually created a narrative uh, that was very used, used and, and kind of obviously designed uh, to overthrow the government. So, um, and do you want me to take uh, any questions on that now before the end, in case there was anything technical? Or should I keep going and take, just take all the questions at the end? Well, we can certainly put out a call for questions, Mark. Uh, if, if folks do have questions on what Mark has already presented, uh, you can either indicate uh, that you have a question in the chat or you can use the participants button uh, at the bottom of your screen, slightly to the left of center. If you click that and then click the raise hand feature, uh, then we will see uh, a little blue hand that pops up in your screen uh, and then we can call on you. Um, so we'll put the call out right now. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Mark on what he's already presented, uh, let us know. If not, we'll, uh, we'll carry on. Okay, thanks. I, I, do, see, I do see one uh, uh, from my brother, John Ratliff. Uh, so I will uh, put the spotlight on you and, uh, and go ahead and ask your question of Mark, John. Okay, Mark, thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, it does seem, though, to me that I've read stories of meetings prior to the election in the U.S. Embassy with some of the people around the San Jose region that had been a separatist region and hostile to the uh, Morales regime and everything. And this coup followed pretty rapidly on, you know, the... Uh, crazy events that happened in Brazil with the impeachment of uh, Delma Rousseff and then the uh, case against Lula that barred him from running in the election and the situation in Ecuador where the government came in and flipped roles and got a huge loan, the efforts to suppress dissent in Argentina. And I wonder if there doesn't seem to be sort of a pattern that's going along here. Uh, I notice in Ecuador, they're threatening to uh, ban the only party sort of dissenting from the current regime um, left in the race, a pattern of trying to uh, restore uh, the domination that used to exist. The OAS to me really hasn't had, you said that it's generally been good about these things, but at least that's what I thought I heard you say, but I know in Venezuela, it's not certainly not been a neutral party that in um, uh, Nicaragua, it's not been a neutral party. So I just wondered, Haiti is another example where they're, you know, having- Yes, played. all I said, believe me, okay. I, I've written a lot about the OAS and- Okay, uh, <laughs> all right. It's not, you know, First of all, um, the bureaucracy of the OAS is, is controlled to a large degree by the U.S. government. So even when you have, you know, even when you had at the peak of the strength of the left governments in Latin America in the 21st century, you know, the 2006, 2010 or so, you, you, you still had uh, problems. Um, you know, the 2013 election in Venezuela, for example, in Sulsa was one of three uh, parties, two, there were two governments actually, uh, the United States and Spain and him were the last three people who wouldn't recognize that election and then they finally had to give in. Uh, so yeah, and he was the head, of, he was the Secretary General. So no, I'm not saying the OAS was clean before the day, I'm just saying that in terms of their electoral observation, I would say most of them are not, they don't cheat, okay? But some they do. And they, I, I was going to mention this and I'll also answer all of what you said about the US role because it's also something we've been writing about for the past 20 years. And it's a terrible role, of course. And uh, the general, um, you know, it, it's, I mean, the general strategy of the US government under uh, Bush and Obama in Latin America was very uh, similar. Um, and it was to uh, kind of try and get rid of all of the left uh, governments whenever opportunities arose and sometimes even when they didn't. And uh, I don't think that's an exaggeration. I mean, I can go through, 
you know, I mean, I'll just mention some of the examples where the U.S. played a role in undermining left governments, you know, uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, Paraguay, Honduras, the two, those two, they actually uh, helped uh, coups that, that took place uh, and a military coup in, in Honduras. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's the standard role that's you know it's 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 basically a very anti-democratic role that our government has, and it doesn't change uh, drastically uh, from one administration to the next. And there's a lot of reason for that we can talk about as well. So, but I'm just saying in terms of <laughs> observation, electoral observation, in most uh, elections they'll give a straight uh, result, but when they don't they can really destroy a country. And they did that to Haiti in 2000, in 2000 uh, for example, when they put out an initial report that said, yeah, the election was good and it was good. And then uh, the US began uh, a regime change effort uh, that ended in the coup of 2004. And so uh, during uh, that period, those four years, the OAS changed their uh, their reporting on the, the same election that they first said was good. And they said it was, it was basically, uh, they didn't use the word stolen like they did in, in this case, but they said it was very wrong and so wrong that it, it was just some Senate, uh, senators that they were arguing about. They weren't arguing about the president because he won a landslide, but they, uh, they did this a very similar thing they did in Bolivia. They created the pretext that was used to undermine, cut off aid in this case, uh, to Haiti's government for four years. It was all based, if you read it all, any, you can go back and read all the news reports, the cutoff of international aid led by the United States and France and Canada. And it was, it was done allegedly because of the 2000 election which again, the OAS had originally said was clean and fair and then changed. And that was the basis that led to uh, the destabilization and uh, really uh, terrible uh, poverty uh, during uh, that time. Um, I mean, it was already a poor country, but the cutoff of international aid was devastating. And then uh, the coup of, of 2004. And then the, in Haiti, they also did uh, in, in 2011, and we wrote about this extensively. And this is why I'm making such a big deal, by the way, the, uh, of the OAS, what the OAS did. And one reason is that it took nine years for the Miami Herald to finally report what the OAS did in Haiti in 2011. It just came out this year. And we wrote about it, of course, and did a statistical analysis and everything else uh, back when it happened. But in, in 2011, uh, the OAS did something that uh, no electoral observer, in my knowledge, has ever done. They simply reversed the results of the first round of the presidential election in Haiti. And they did it without, even a, uh, without a recount and without even a statistical analysis. So yeah, they are, when the United States wants to use them as a political instrument, they can't always do it. And, but they do it, uh, they do it, you know, they've done it. And uh, those are the two cases in the 21st uh, century uh, where they were most devastating and they really did destroy democracy in both of those countries uh, by doing that. So uh, let me get back to um, the, uh, the rest, because I want to get into the U.S. role uh, a little bit, and also uh, just a little bit more on the OAS, because I think it's it's quite phenomenal. Here you have the Secretary General, and so what did he do when the New York Times finally ran this article of June seventh, which was the first thing you know, it kind of reversed their previous eight months of reporting, which was just reporting what the OAS said without any uh, even you know another person maybe contradicting it, and. Uh, and he wrote this 3,200 word uh, press release. And I'll quote that, recognizing the New York Times right to lie, distort, and twist information, data and facts, the mixed truth with lies as often as it wishes, 
And then he accused the Times of having a well-documented controversial history with truth in relation to dictatorships and totalitarianism. And so went back to their reporting on the Soviet Union 90 years ago, which he claimed was, quote, ultimately more a defense of Stalin than of truth. And they were instrumental in building a pro-Castro uh, narrative and so on. And on this basis, he accuses them of wanting to promote Evo Morales um, and totalitarianism in, uh, in uh, Bolivia. So this is who's running an organization that represents countries with a population of around a billion people. And uh, so that's something to, to think about here. And it did uh, damage them. Uh, you know, I mean, sadly, I mean, that, that, that release damaged them more than the actual coup that they uh, helped carry out. So uh, the, uh, just, I, I won't go into the details of their final uh, report. And, you know, just to mention that they, they never, even in that final report, they never really presented any evidence that the problems that they alleged in the, uh, the uh, preliminary count um, changed the official count in any uh, fraudulent way. So the official count decided the election and um, they didn't really have anything there either. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, I think um, that's why they're, they're, I think, this worried as they are that this discussion is starting to gain and that their credibility is being eroded, but they're still scheduled to observe the October 18th uh, election. And uh, so I think it is important. And we have had, you know, there is stuff in the news. I wrote a piece for The Guardian a few weeks ago, and there's going to be more uh, coming out so that they'll be uh, held to account. And they won't hopefully be able to uh, do any of the kinds of things they did the last time. Now, uh, I want to just say a couple more words about the the racist nature of the repression and the state violence since October and the, the, and the government itself. You know, uh, Agnes, uh, Janine Agnes, who's a senator who took over uh, after the coup and uh, promised uh, elections uh, that were canceled three times. So we don't really know if the ones that uh, are going to happen on October 18th will happen, but I, it seems, you know, if I have to guess, I think they might. They probably will. And she referred to indigenous religious practices in the past as satanic. And the Washington Post reported that she, quote, warned voters in January against allowing the return of supporters. So that's the kind of government uh, that's running the country uh, now. And uh, um, Okay, and just a little bit about the U.S. role, because that was mentioned by the uh, person who spoke. Um, and I think that uh, there definitely was uh, a U.S. role. Uh, we, first of all, the New York Times, the LA Times reported that Carlos Trujillo, the U.S. ambassador to the OAS, had steered the group's election monitoring team to report widespread fraud and push the Trump administration to support the ouster of Morales. Now that's just the report, and she, uh, you know, there, there wasn't any follow-up to that, and nobody else uh, bothered to look into it. Uh, and that's again, that's a problem with, we have with the, with the media. They're not looking into the story. There's there's plenty they could find. They just went to the OAS and started asking around. I'm sure they would. We would find that they would find things, and we found things because we we had, we talked to people inside the OAS, and we were able to find things that are are still not uh, uh, public knowledge. So I think they could do that. But there was also the there was a tweet uh, from Rubio even before the uh, OAS press release came out, and it said. Uh, in Bolivia, all credible indications are Evo Morales failed to secure a necessary margin to avoid second round in presidential election. 
And then he claimed there was some concern that he will tamper with the results or process to avoid this. So he's, you know, he's the, uh, what is the political column, uh, effectively a secretary of state for Latin America for this administration. And, and then there was the Trump administration itself issued a press release uh, following the coup saying that Morales' departure preserves democracy and paves the way for the Bolivian people to have their voices heard. So what else did they do? We don't really know uh, yet, but I assume that eventually uh, more will come out uh, in terms of the, the U.S. role. So uh, I can stop there and talk about other things that uh, people are interested in. I know that the hosts wanted to say, to talk a little bit about the elections in the U.S. and what impact that might have and so on. So why don't I leave it there and people can pick the things that they want to uh, know more about, if I can answer. Sure, thanks, thanks, Mark. Uh, I appreciate the the presentation. Uh, very, very useful. Um, and and just to remind folks, and I do see your hand, Marcus, and you're next uh, in line. Uh, but just to remind uh, folks that to ask a question, you hit the participants button at the bottom of your screen, and then hit the raise hand button and a little blue hand will appear uh, as is on Marcus's screen. And then I will call on you uh, in turn. And uh, the floor is now going to be yours, Marcus. You're up. Uh, go ahead with your question to Mark. Just- Yes. The, uh, the interest in the United States, I, I know in the case of Guatemala in 1954, it was the United Fruit Company that wanted to get rid of Arbenz. Uh, who were the particular uh, folks in the USA who had a strong interest in getting rid of uh, Morales? That was one question. I have a second question. Is there pending le legislation or resolution and is there a number that we can refer to when we, when we talk about uh, Jan Schakowsky's effort to get an investigation of the OAS? Thanks. Okay, I'll I'll take the second question first. There isn't any resolution in the Congress on this yet, so, but I think uh, just supporting the call for an investigation. And she she that's on the that's on the web. She called for an investigation of the OAS, and uh, that I think is a is a worthwhile effort to try and force that. And you know the reason I emphasize Congress, by the way, is just because you know, Congress has a an independent role in the U.S that most countries don't have in terms of foreign policy. And it uh, doesn't always use it, obviously it doesn't use that often, but it can. And, and you know, when we've made uh, changes in US foreign policy in the past, it's generally been the Congress. So that's why I, I, I'm pressing for that. And the second thing is um, your question about whose interest. You know, I wouldn't say that uh, a large part of the U.S. interventions in the 21st century were uh, driven by uh, private interests. In fact, you know, in the extreme case, you can see uh, Venezuela, where uh, for years there, after Chavez was elected, uh, he, uh, you know, he had very good relations with two of the biggest oil companies in the United States, uh, Chevron uh, and, and uh, ExxonMobil, and uh, they wanted to make money there. And they were making money, even though it wasn't quite as much as they were making before. And they they didn't really uh, they, they did turn against them much much later. But I'm just saying that it wasn't really like that. It was really I think most of this stuff comes from uh, it, it, it comes from the so-called national security state, the the uh, you know the 17 intelligence agencies, the State Department, the foreign policy committees of Congress the National Security Council, the Pentagon. Uh, these are, you know, and especially Latin America, uh, these are the bodies that make the decision. And most presidents don't even pay that much attention to it, except as in, in so far as it affects elections. So the Florida uh, question, you know, in presidential election, that's why things are very bad right now. You know, it's very hard to get anything accomplished in, in 
anything positive, at least in Congress right now, because everybody's afraid of that. But it is, it is really much more about uh, power. Uh, I think that's generally true about US foreign policy. It, it is much more about power than it is uh, about uh, particular interests. Now, the, obviously, the commercial agreements are different. I mean, those are written by corporations, NAFTA, CAFTA, do we have to, and all those. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and then also true for other things. But these, if you look at the major interventions in the US in Latin America in the 21st century, even before that, a lot. Uh, they were really uh, driven by an attempt to just uh, own the hemisphere, uh, basically. Thanks, Mark. Uh, that actually makes me think of a, a question myself. Um, it's my understanding that uh, uh, despite uh, Evo Morales' um, commitment to making lives better uh, for the average people uh, in, in Bolivia, and I don't think anyone can argue that that uh, he didn't improve things like literacy, education, uh, healthcare. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, economic elites also did very well uh, under, under his presidency. Um, so uh, why, why the desire to, to remove uh, a leader uh, who was presiding over one of the fastest growing economies in the world, uh, which, benefited economic elites as well as the common people. Yes, I mean, it was, it was a, for some years, it was the fastest growing uh, economy in, in uh, South America, and it did do vastly uh, better than, you know, the recent or even the last 20 years. I mean, it was horrible before. When Evo uh, became uh, president, uh, income per person was actually lower than it had been 27 years earlier. And then it, it took off. And yeah, the, it's true that uh, a lot of people did make a lot of money. And so the question is, you know, why do they still want to overthrow the government? And that's where I think the U.S. does play a, a big role. Because, you know, if you took the U.S. out of the picture, out of the equation, and this is true, I think, in most of the countries like this, um, they, they would reach an accommodation even though they don't like the person, they would accept that they're, you know, and for a little while they did do that in Bolivia too, because they was a little bit like South Africa at the end of apartheid. They just were figuring, well, you can't uh, disenfranchise the majority of the people uh, for forever. And let's try to work with the, with, with this guy. And uh, so, um, you know, uh, I think the fact that you've always got these, the most powerful government in the world with unlimited resources. You know, one of the reasons that Evo didn't have uh, full ambassadorial relations, ambassadorial relations with, uh, with the U.S. since uh, 2009 was because the U.S. was uh, putting in uh, about 1% of GDP, which is quite large, it was like more than we spend on the Iraq war, uh, into uh, Bolivia through uh, USAID and wouldn't disclose where the money was going. And it was obviously going to opposition forces and said, well, you can't tell us, you know, bye. And, uh, and so, uh, I mean, he still had good relations, but he just didn't, he kicked out the U.S. ambassador because the U.S. ambassador was also conspiring with the, with the opposition, meeting with them at the time when they were engaging in violence and trying to they had a separatist movement. It was quite dangerous in, in 2008, 2009. And so, uh, you know, this was, uh, so, so this is part of the picture that we're, we're talking about here. And um, yeah, I think that uh, they, the, the short answer <laughs> is, and it's similar, it's not, it's, it's, it's very different in different countries, by the way. I mean, you know, it's like what Dan Quayle famously said he went to Latin America, they're all different countries down there. You know, but it, you, know, you can't really generalize that much, but you know, in at least some places that I'm familiar with, uh, like Bolivia and Venezuela, uh, you know, uh, you do have, you just have people who, they, they always ran the country and they just don't want to give that up. And again, they have this superpower that's going to back them up and help them a lot. 
uh, if they succeed in displacing the elected government. Thanks, Mark. Uh, next, I'm going to take another question uh, from the audience. Uh, Michael Goodman, uh, you are up next. Go ahead with your question uh, for Mark. Okay, yeah, I had a couple of uh, brief uh, questions. Uh, first, uh, where is Morales now? Is he still uh, in Mexico? And what are his political plans? Does he uh, hope ultimately to uh, return uh, to Bolivia? Then my other quick question is, uh, are there parallels between uh, what happened in Bolivia with Morales and what happened in nearby Ecuador with regard to Correa? Thanks. Yes, I think that uh, Evo is, as last I heard, he's in Argentina. And I don't know what his plans are. He doesn't, you know, he hasn't expressed plans to go back because, uh, you know, they have a, a very repressive government that would immediately throw him in jail. Um, what he's going to do in the future, it's going to, you know, it'll depend on what happens. Um, I don't think he's retiring uh, from politics, but I don't think that he necessarily, you know, has this need to, to run the show or anything when he's not president. And uh, the second part was, oh yeah, Ecuador, yeah. Well, uh, I, you know, Ecuador is another case, and this is amazing how little press uh, this has gotten. This is a case where you had a left government, and I won't tell a long story here, but, uh, you know, this was another very successful uh, government, and it was one of the most successful in terms of changing in institutions and innovative economic policies, and we've written uh, several uh, papers on that. You know, for example, they were able to use quantitative easing when they don't even have their own currency, they have the dollar. And they did some very innovative things to uh, minimize the impact of oil price collapses because they're an oil exporter. And they did very well. And uh, what happened there was uh, the person who ran with the party of Rafael Correa, the president from uh, you know, who was elected in uh, 2006, took office in 2007. Um, you know, the uh, Lenin Moreno d decided, uh, uh, you know, when he uh, was elected to go over to more of a right wing, uh, more neoliberal side. And so you've had a lot of uh, repression there to keep this large movement because the Alianza País, the political party, the Correistas, as they're now called, uh, was, uh, was a mass party and it was a very, you know, a lot of active people. And so they've done all these things to try and prevent them from returning uh, to power uh, through election. And uh, so they, you know, first they, they went after, well, they went after a whole bunch of people, but they, uh, you know, Correa uh, was, has been charged with, I don't know how many, uh, crimes. I think there's 25 cases. And, you know, the, the main one, uh, it's all kind of trumped up uh, charges. In fact, uh, you know, Interpol, which is the international police agency that where the U.S. has enormous influence, wouldn't even put out a warrant uh, for his arrest because of the political nature of the charges against him. And that case has kind of fallen apart, uh, but they've, uh, uh, well, it hasn't fallen apart in the sense that they still, you know, are, are using it as part of uh, the reason that they're um, not allowing him to, uh, um, to uh, run for office or even come back. He'll be jailed if he comes back to Ecuador. And so the, uh, at the, in the current, and, and then what they did was, you know, the Correistas had to find other parties in order to register. And so uh, the electoral authorities just canceled uh, their, they suspended, for example, uh, the uh, Fuerza Compromiso Social from the register of political parties on uh, July 19th this year so that they wouldn't be able, so they had to find another political party. Of course, that makes it very difficult to run. But in, in, in spite of all that, uh, 
and I could go through all the other uh, things they've done. But uh, today there was actually some, some, some good news. The Electoral Council, under a fair amount of inter international uh, pressure, agreed to let the Correistas, uh, led by Andres Arraus uh, as the presidential candidate, uh, to register for the February 2nd election. And that was not, we didn't think that was going to happen, actually, because all the rumors were that they, the government pressured them and they had a three to two uh, majority that was going to say uh, no and just make something up again. They didn't have anything. And by the way, full disclosure here, Andres uh, Arauz is actually a colleague of mine. He was a research associate at CEPR until he decided to run for president uh, just recently. And, that, and he's fairly, he was not well known. And that's one reason they can't <laughs> get rid of him that easily because everybody who they wanted to get rid of they would make up some legal case against them, but they didn't do that to him because he just entered and he didn't have a, a electoral, uh, you know, he, he didn't, they didn't think of him. And he had Correa as his vice president, uh, a vice presidential candidate, but they just uh, kicked him out off the ticket, like uh, I think it was a few weeks ago. And so uh, that's the situation there. So that's going to be really important. Uh, going forward, because if they if they don't uh, come up with some kind of illegal maneuver to kick them out of the race, he's doing very well and he's ahead in the polls, and he will probably win, uh, mainly on the basis of the strength of, of the vast difference between what the country's been like since Correa left and while he was there. I certainly hope you're right. Uh, thanks for that uh, answer, Mark. Uh, next up, uh, we have a question uh, from someone who's been working on, on Bolivia a lot uh, through her organization, uh, Code Pink. Uh, Medea Benjamin, you're up next uh, for your question uh, for Mark Weisbra. Great. Hi, Mark, and thanks for the positive news on Ecuador. That's great. Uh, in the case of Bolivia, uh, you know, our organization is trying to send observers down and we have one person who got their credentials, but so far the DC uh, consulate has been very uh, difficult to uh, work with and, and credential us. And we hear that's happening to other observer groups in other countries as well. And I wonder what, uh, if you have heard the rumor that they might still ban Evo's party, Moss, from running in this election. And the other thing I wanted to ask you really relates to what you were talking about with Ecuador, which is, you know, given the uh, economic uh, meltdown that's going to happen when the full uh, weight of coronavirus weighs in in Latin America, do you think this might be a push more towards a, a progressive pink tide or do you think it might go the other way? Thank you. Thanks, Medea, and thanks for doing the uh, organizing I, uh, on the observers. We're doing a little bit of that too, but I, I deliberately didn't go into that because I saw that you were here and I knew that you would uh, explain that and mention that. And so, uh, yeah, so I think on the second question of, uh, where do I think the, it's going? I think there is going to be a comeback because, um, well, first of all, there already has been some, right? You had AMLO was elected in Mexico, a historic election, uh, you know, the first left uh, government that, you know, since I don't know when. Um, and the, uh, and then you had, and of course, by the way, the Mexican government's been helping a lot uh, with Bolivia in the OAS. They've been fighting in there. And uh, so has the Argentine government, which also has a progressive foreign policy. And I didn't mention, you know, the pressure, by the way. So this is kind of a, you know, in a, way, a throwback to the uh, first decade of the 21st century, where these uh, governments are, uh, are pushing back and, and pushing back against the U.S., and it's and it's it's more than that. You know, one of the things that put pressure on the um, Ecuadorian government in these last two days—I don't know—I can't say that it's responsible for their uh, 
uh, allowing this candidacy at this moment. Uh, but uh, 13 Latin American uh, former presidents, and uh, even also uh, Jose Miguel Insulza from the former Secretary of the Secretary General of the OAS, because you had all these presidents and you had all these foreign ministers, they signed a statement about it. Who are saying, you know, we're really worried about this. What's going on? And that's very rare. I can't remember that ever happening in the last 20 years, where a group of countries did that. You know, because they have a, you know, there's a general non-interventionist uh, stance, you know, when it comes to these things. And they wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, there's been some exceptions recently that were driven by the U.S. But I'm, I'm talking about just, you know, independent, uh, you know, famous you know, former president saying, we, we're worried about this election in, in Ecuador and what's going to happen in terms of uh, allowing uh, candidates to uh, participate. And so, yeah, I think that's the initial, these are the initial forays of the, uh, you know, the, res the resurgence that you will see. I, I think there will be one because, um, again, I, I don't want to generalize because if you look at how the left became done in any of the countries where they have fallen, it's a different story and has a lot to do with very uh, specific uh, conditions. But I think that uh, the reason I'm optimistic is that, you know, you really did see an enormous improvement in living standards under the left governments. You look at like, 2003 to 2013, poverty was reduced from 44% to 28% uh, in, in the hemisphere. That's huge. The 20 years prior, poverty actually increased. Okay, so this was a massive uh, change, positive, and now it's gone to hell. And so uh, people will when they're getting, and, that, and that's why I think these governments like Brazil, for example, and Ecuador and Bolivia have had to resort to state violence uh, in order to, uh, and, and in this, you know, what I think is kind of euphemistically called lawfare in, in, in Ecuador, but it's, it's basically illegal, it's persecution of political opponents, I mean, very open. And uh, that's why they've had to do that, because if you give people a chance to vote, the left is going to get voted back in, in most countries. I mean, that's what happened in the 21st century. It was the first time that people had really the opportunity to vote for left governments, you know, before the 21st century or before, you know, 98 when Chavez ran, he didn't even want to run because the left just uh, still believed that it wasn't possible that you could really, uh, you know, you, you couldn't really elect and maintain and keep in power uh, a progressive government. And, and then it, once it got going, you had all of these countries uh, had left or left of center uh, governments and uh, the majority of the hemisphere was under left governments at the peak. And that is, uh, that's where they're going to go. Um, I mean, there's other factors involved too. You know, the left governments have, uh, you know, took up the, the kind of progressive uh, sovereignty and nationalist issues as well. Uh, and that's a big issue because it's, it's vital in Latin America, right? You're not going to get progress there from governments that are attached uh, to the United States. And so you, you have to have that independence that these governments had. And they did really bring a, a kind of second independence to Latin America. But they also did a whole bunch of things. I mean, that's one of the, those are the things we've been writing about, the changes in macroeconomic policy, the changes in health and education policy, changes in, you know, Bolivia was a good case of a uh, huge increase in public investment. Uh, again, it was different emphasis and different amounts of different policies in all the countries, getting rid of the IMF was huge in, in, in these countries. And now the IMF is coming back since the left has, has uh, fallen in certain countries. In Argentina, they were back. Uh, in, uh, under Macri, the, um, and in Ecuador, they're back. But uh, I don't think, the, the last thing I'll say about this is you don't really see a neoliberal uh, set of movements, policies, politicians in any of the countries that I'm uh, familiar with 
that really can, can govern, that has the ability and the capacity to govern. In other words, you know, they, they don't even know how to put together the basic macroeconomic policies that would allow, you know, the economic growth that you need to keep people satisfied and employed and everything else. They, they really don't have the basics, you know, and you can see that in Brazil, for example, and you can see that in Ecuador. I mean, and you see that under Macri in Argentina, my God, you know, they, <laughs> I mean, he, he could have, uh, you know, he could have survived if he, if he didn't go take this IMF agreement that destroyed the economy. Um, and uh, so, uh, or he'd have, he would have had a chance at least. And so that's, that's the other part of the uh, equation here. Thanks. Uh, I, I, th I think we're starting to see that inability to, to respond uh, uh, to people's economic needs in, in this country uh, as well. Um, but uh, next, I, I want to turn it over um, uh, to uh, a member of the Lift the Sanctions Coalition uh, here in Massachusetts uh, and, and my friend uh, Selena De, De La Croce. Uh, go ahead with your question for Mark. Hey, Mark. Um, thank you for speaking, first of all, and for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask, so in November in Western Mass, we organized, when the coup happened, we organized to put pressure on um, McGovern Senators uh, Warren and Markey to condemn the coup with some, varied but some success. And we've kind of, we um, worked with MAPA, with this coalition, to send out a letter to them again, kind of calling on them, you know, ahead of the elections. And I'm wondering um, what you think are the most, like, strategic things that we can ask at this time um, that we can kind of pressure our representatives to do from the belly of the beast. Um, you know, I know you mentioned uh, the investigating the OAS, which is, I wonder, maybe more of a long term thing, but what like what maybe specific demands should we be um, asking for now ahead of the elections or right around the corner? Yes, well, I think the reason I, I'm focusing on the OAS is because it is a way you already got the the members of Congress who want that, and it is a way of discrediting this false narrative as well, which still is you know is is being used. Uh, in fact, Almagro is up there right now. He just sent out a tweet today saying warning that there could be fraud, and he wasn't talking about the the, the coup government committing fraud. He was talking about the Moss. So I think it is going to be. Uh, it, it's the best thing that I can think of right now. I mean, if you can get these members of Congress to issue uh, statements, that helps a lot too. Those go in, into the media and, uh, you know, statements that show that they're watching uh, this election and statements that actually uh, do call it a, a coup as well. I think here's the problem you're going to have right now is that everything is really much more difficult in terms of U.S. politics between now and the election. And that's because of Florida. You know, you know everybody, uh, every member of Congress, uh, all the, you know, they're all, and we're only talking about Democrats here, um, they're all worried about the presidential election and, of course, the Senate, the Republican Party, and and Florida is is important. Florida is obviously, you know, Trump can't even win this election without uh, Florida. So they're worried about anything that can spill over into that. And that's why they're staying away from Latin America entirely. Not all of them, but I'm saying the ones that would normally respond to you on this. So I think uh, that's a problem. And it's going to be hard to start something new between now and then, in between now and the October election. But I think to the extent that you can get uh, meetings with your representatives and your senators and, uh, and explain these kind of things to them, and we can bring people to, you know, and ask them to intervene in the, in the media, to, to say these things, to tell the truth about the coup, that would be uh, very, very important, I think. 
Can I just add for a plug? Thank you for answering that. I'm going to put the link back in the chat if people are able to sign on to the letter. We are asking for a meeting with McGovern. Um, and so that's very helpful in thinking about what we should bug him for. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Selena. And thanks for, for your work uh, in, in encouraging that pressure. Um, I, have a, I have a question myself. Um, Hold on, just let me put the spotlight on myself. Um, uh, last night, we, we uh, hosted a, a, a program uh, on the struggles of the Garifuna people in Honduras and uh, an expert that we had on, uh, Karen Spring from the uh, Honduras uh, Solidarity Network, uh, mentioned the opportunity of, uh, of a new chairperson of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Elliot Engel, a very hawkish uh, con conservative Democrat from New York, was defeated by Jamal Bowman. Uh, so they will be looking for a new uh, chairman or, or chairwoman. And uh, uh, Representative Joaquin Castro has actually put himself forward in public, uh, which is quite unusual. Uh, and um, given the power uh, that the chairperson holds, the ability to call hearings, to, to really highlight uh, some of the struggles that are going around uh, in countries uh, around the world. Uh, I was wondering your opinion of, of Representative Castro uh, and whether and how we might support his bid uh, for the chairmanship of that important committee. Yeah, I think it's definitely worth supporting. Um, and, you know, it's opening up the process, as you mentioned, you know, for the uh, you know, the chair is selected. And I think it's, I think, he, you know, he has, he has made a number of positive statements on changing U.S. foreign policy uh, against these kind of regime change efforts. Um, again, you know, it's someone in that position is not necessarily going to do as much as uh, we would think or hope, but uh, I think he's definitely uh, he's definitely likely to be better than, you know, anybody that had in recent memory. Thanks, I actually have another question as well. You mentioned earlier in your, uh, in your presentation um, that uh, the, the policy, the US policy towards Latin America did actually did not change much uh, uh, from George W. Bush's administration uh, to Barack Obama's uh, administration. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, why that was and um, the consequences of, of, uh, of Barack Obama's failure uh, to improve uh, US policy towards Latin America. It seems to me that there was a, a big opportunity missed there. I was wondering if you could go into that. Yeah, well, uh... That's a, you know, that's a question that could take an hour, but I'll, I guess the shortest answer I could give you would be that first, it wasn't a priority for Obama. He wasn't going to, you know, he only has so many hours in the day and that wasn't one he was going to put a lot of time into. He had never set foot in Latin America before he was uh, president. And it just wasn't, you know, it, you know, this is the, one of the problems that Latin America mm -hmm. suffers from. If you look at DC, for example, everybody who cares about foreign policy mostly doesn't care about Latin America, and the ones who do are generally uh, doing bad things. And so uh, that's the problem that a president comes in to, and he wasn't going to, you know, except for the Cuba policy. You know, there were a couple, you know, which he, he did, uh, that he, he did try to change that and did temporarily, uh, but it wasn't, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say it was done with a, any kind of a progressive goal. It was more a way for the United States to get more influence there. And uh, so it, I don't know how much of a change it was, but it was definitely a positive step uh, because, you know, it's what the Cubans wanted. And it also, um, you know, it's a step towards uh, normal. It was some big steps towards normalizing relations, which is long overdue. Uh, so I think, but other than that, he, he did, he was very similar. I mean, you know, the, the, his administration supported the coup in Honduras, for example. 
in, in many ways. And um, Hillary Clinton wrote about it in, in her memoirs. You know, she, she wrote about how she uh, worked within the OAS, it was the OAS again, uh, to uh, make sure uh, that uh, the democratically elected president couldn't return. And I could go through a whole list and we have articles about all these uh, things about, you know, how much policy didn't change. And so I guess the question of why is, is mainly because it takes pressure because you have this enormous inertia. You know, uh, Obama didn't even really uh, tell some of his most important, highest people in the State Department about the Cuba, uh, at least in Latin America section, about the opening relations with Cuba until uh, three weeks before it was made public. And that's because you know, he couldn't trust them. And so this is what you're talking about. There's enormous inertia here with this uh, so-called national security uh, state. Now, I'm not making any excuses. I think a president can change these things, but more likely it's going to come from grassroots pressure and, and grassroots pressure on the Congress, like it did in the 1980s, for example, when you know Reagan, when they cut off aid to the coal reserves in the Congress. And unfortunately, it wasn't enough because Reagan was committed and he went around and did illegal things and almost got impeached uh, because of uh, what he had to do to get that money. But I'm just saying that, that is where historically uh, change in the, our foreign policy has, has come from. And uh, it's, it's a real, uh, it's, it's a hard problem, but I, I really think it can be done here on the positive side. You can change things with a relative handful of people. And some of you probably know that here uh, because, you know, there, in, in many of these cases, most of the cases we're talking about in Latin America, there isn't a powerful lobby uh, in the Congress contributing money that really cares what happens in Ecuador or uh, Bolivia or, uh, you know, even Argentina. And uh, so if you get your, and, and they're not, you know, if you get a meeting with uh, a couple dozen people and you're a member of Congress and you explain the situation and what you want and there's people in the district that care about it, they will very often uh, change. I've seen it happen many times. And so that is why uh, I, I do think that going forward, we're going to uh, win some change. You have some proposals, by the way, Ilan Omar has a bill uh, to, this is a great bill, and we've helped with it too, uh, the, to make it so sanctions have to be approved by the Congress. It's kind of like a war powers, the 1973 uh, war powers resolution. It's uh, the same thing for sanctions as for war. And that would be great. And I think those are the kind of one of the possibilities we could get. And, you know, sanction, that would be a huge step forward. I, I believe that sanctions are, are uh, possibly a more powerful destructive influence of U.S. foreign policy right now than the military itself. Uh, and so this is, and this is something that, that is going to go away at some point because the rest of the world won't uh, tolerate it indefinitely. Uh, but, um, you know, it's based on the U.S. control over the international financial system and the dollar is a key currency where 60% of the central bank reserves are in dollars. But that isn't going to go on forever. So there are, there are changes that can be made. There are people in Congress who will initiate them. And, but we need uh, more pressure from the grassroots. But it won't, it, it'll pick up. After the election, uh, the typical representative is going to respond to their constituency as they have in, in the past to an organized to organize groups like the people here, like Mass Peace Action, and they're going to make uh, some changes. I really believe that. Thanks, and uh, I'm I'm really glad that you brought up uh, Representative Omar's uh, congressional oversight of of Sanctions uh, Act. That is that is a piece of legislation that uh, we at Mass Peace Action and the Lift the Sanctions Coalition, of course, uh, has been has been supporting. Um, uh, oh, can one I mention my... one other thing on that? Because sure, sure, please, please do. A letter on Ecuador that people are gathering signatures for uh, also 
from members of Congress. And uh, so, you know, you can find out on any of this if you want info on something like that that's going on. Just do a email to seeper at seeper.net, our general email, and it'll go to the right person and you can get information if you want to. Seeper at seeper.net. Yeah. Anything uh, you want to do in Congress uh, or, you know, related to this, it doesn't have to be in Congress. It could be just grassroots. You need, you know, you want to, any help from us or you want, uh, uh, you know, information, just send that and we'll respond. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, for that resource. We, we, uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, and I'll be sure to send that out uh, as, as well as uh, uh, some of the links that we discussed uh, in this program uh, in a follow-up email. Uh, to everyone who uh, is on the call and registered. And I encourage everybody uh, to share it widely uh, with their friends and, and contacts that could not be here with us uh, live. This is a lot of uh, information that you don't see uh, on the mainstream media. Uh, so we need to get it out uh, ourselves uh, as much as possible. Uh, and I would just let everyone know that you can see uh, all of the programming that we put on on um, the Mass Peace Action YouTube page, and I'll be sending a, a link to that as well. Uh, it, it helps if people subscribe, and as always, please uh, spread the word uh, to your friends and, and family. Um, before we end the program, I, I would just ask uh, if you have any uh, last words uh, and, and advice uh, for the people uh, on this call, uh, Mark. Uh, any final words? Well, no, just an appreciation of all of your work. I think, you, I think it really has an influence. As I said, after this election, uh, there's going to be a lot more opportunities uh, going forward. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to everyone who uh, tuned in um, to a really fantastic program. Um, uh, just one more time, I want to thank all of the co-sponsors that helped uh, put this on uh, besides Mass Peace Action and our Latin America uh, working group. I, I would also like to thank uh, Lift the Sanctions Massachusetts, Maine Peace Action, New Hampshire Peace Action, Boston CISPIS, the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice, Western New York Peace Center, and the Internationalism Working Group of Boston DSA. Uh, thank you all for your help uh, in putting this on. And of course, uh, thank you, Mark Weisbrot, for joining us and, and for your great presentation. Um, I hope everyone has a fantastic night and, uh, and stay safe. And, and look out for that follow-up email. Uh, it will include ways for you to get involved, including ways uh, to pressure Congress uh, and to provide some direct relief uh, to indigenous communities in Bolivia who are struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic. So thanks everyone uh, for joining Thank us you. and have a fantastic night.